and she has a date with a dentist today. Bless her heart. I'm I sorry. Really hate, hate to hear that. I've been there so many times. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Just, beautiful face to everyone today. <laughs> it's yeah. not so today. <laughs> Okay, let's see. I'm going to put it on speaker view and and I have the recording on so we're going to get going here and if you will put yourself on mute. I don't want to mute everybody because I'm afraid that you won't be able to mute yourself or unmute yourself if you have a comment or a question but go ahead and uh, mute yourself i think that will be the best thing for us so there's no background information uh, noise or interruption because that's kind of distracting and uh, heaven knows i can't be too distracted or <laughs> I completely lose where I am and what I'm talking about. So that's never a good thing. But <clears throat> it's good to see everybody. We've got uh, pretty much the uh, our good crowd here with that we have every Tuesday morning. And it's such a wonderful thing that you're remaining faithful um, and reading God's story and remaining um, uh where he is feeding our souls through his word and we desperately all of us desperately need that so let's um begin this morning with asking the lord's blessing on our time and meeting and again i'm just so thankful to see every one of you here this morning thank you lord for your word thank you for the preservation of all of this information that you have given to us about your servant David and the covenant that you made with him and the prophecy about sending your son into this broken and lost world. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for his power, for his word, for his salvation to us all. Help us to glean carefully in our hearts today all the things that you want to teach us from your word so that we can grow and thrive and be useful to you in that way for anything it is that you're trying to um, accomplish in our lives so that the joy of your presence in our lives is always with us. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Sorry, <I'm, clears throat> I try to talk a little bit in the mornings to get my voice warmed up, but some mornings it gets all like a frog in my throat but anyway let's begin this week week 18 begins with chapter 7 of daniel which is a pivotal chapter in scripture as as we've spoken about it is uh it is important for us to have a a, a grasp if you will of how tremendously important this passage uh, the chapter in uh, chapter 7 and then the, the passage in First Chronicles 17 through um, uh, actually just uh, chapter 17 of First Chronicles are actually almost alike. They're very close together. They're very similar. And because of, uh, it, but they are such importance and they are uh, sort of a mountaintop kind of teaching uh, that we run into as we go through. There are uh, several times when God intervenes specifically in the, the affairs of uh, mankind that he has created to send a message via a covenant. 
he did so, uh, a covenant is, uh, is a promise that God makes, and he did so on several occasions before. Probably the first time he initiated his, he's stepping in himself, uh, stepping in and initiating a uh, promise was in the garden. Um, and then he goes on to Noah and to Abraham and to Moses. And <clears throat> he has made promises to uh, those all along. But this one is to David, who at the t at the writing or in the recording or the events that are co uh, going on in chapter 7 is about 1000 BC. So this is a, a little over 3000 years ago that this uh, was recorded and these events occurred. And yet they are as relevant to us today as if they were written <clears throat> in today's uh, press. So it's really important for us to see them in the context of the whole. And I'll begin by just looking at, um, uh, just reminding us again of the covenant promises. And I did that in the writing of your handout that I sent um, along this morning because I don't want to... Uh, get too far off just actually focusing on the scriptures. So I, I tried to put in some thoughts about um, definitions and so forth, but the covenant promises of God is uh, that he speaks his word. And when he makes a promise, when God makes a promise, it will happen. And his word carries every bit of the power of God with it because he spoke creation into existence. It was his word. Um, and let us, and he said, let there be light. And there was light. The power of God's word is unimaginable how massively important uh, that concept of his word as how it is part of describing who he is um, as well as what he does. And he then chooses to send that word, that uh, powerful expression of himself into the life of a chosen person. And in this case, uh, he's speaking it into the life of David, the king who has now been king uh, probably about 10 years, but don't forget he was uh, seven and a half years in Hebron, and then he came to Jerusalem, and a lot of events have happened. The ark has been moved uh, into the city of Jerusalem. He's had a house built, as we see in these first verses, uh, by a, a, a neighboring king, a king to the north of him, has sent uh, wood and supplies to build him a cedar house. And um, so God chooses at this time to speak into the life of David. And um, we are also reminded that God sends a prophet to his kings. This was something initiated by uh, Samuel with Saul, and it is God's way of making sure that his king has access to his word. Remember, a lot of this scripture had not been written or was being written shortly after the events happened. So it wasn't like they could go, the, the king couldn't really go to a passage of scripture necessarily <clears throat> at the time, although they did have the books of Moses uh, to refer to. But God sent, God chose to send a, a man who would be the one who would give his word to the king. And in this case, it is Nathan. And so Nathan uh, and David seem to be talking 
uh, at a particular point in time, and David says, I have a house of cedar, but the Lord is uh, the ark of the Lord, which is a representation of the presence of the Lord on the earth. The presence of the Lord is in a tent, and this just isn't right. So I think we need to build him a temple. And it was not um, uh, thinking, um, you know, that it, it would be something that would be uh, a, a way to describe who God is. It was, it was meant to be a way to provide a place where uh, uh, lots of people could come and access and worship the God who had... Uh, placed Jerusalem um, in their possession, had settled Jerusalem, had made it his city, and had made David king. And it was to honor God. It was not to uh, be like uh, something that was man-made that would be a way to display God somehow. But <clears throat> Nathan said, well, that sounds like a great idea. That, there can't be anything wrong with that. But Nathan, as, as we will see several times, the way the Lord approaches Nathan is in the night. He speaks to him in the night, and then he tells uh, Nathan, what you have, what I've told you, you now have to go and tell uh, David. And this is an important statement in verse 4 of chapter 7 that when um, the Lord speaks to Nathan to tell him what to tell David, he, the Lord speaks to Nathan and he says, go to my servant David. And that is particularly important uh, statement because there are very few times when God himself refers to a human being as a my servant servant. Uh, it, is, it is just an important concept for us that uh, we see it that way. And this is a uh, relationship. It's a special relationship which God identifies between himself and a particularly uh, a particular chosen person. It is a person who has uh, in God's eyes, displayed himself as a bond servant. That is one who has uh, pledged allegiance and has chosen the master. A bond servant was one who could have been um, let go and not become not be a servant anymore, but chose to stay with the master because he loved and wanted to honor and serve that master. That was the concept. It's a bond servant uh, relationship. And I tried to list a few where the scripture refers to, uh, where God refers to them as my servant. And the first one that we read about is Abraham. Go and tell my servant Abraham. And then he calls Moses his servant. Then he calls Caleb uh, remember Caleb and Joshua. He was the spy. Caleb was the one of the 12 spies who spoke out and said, yes, we can take the, Lord, the land. The Lord will be with us. And David is the fourth one that we see. We also see it in Job. It's hard to know where he was, probably even before Abraham, but he's referred to as, he spoke of uh, Job as my servant. He spoke of Isaiah that way. And then he also speaks of the Lord Jesus um, in many of the Psalms and in the prophecies as my servant. So it's, it's not an unwilling slave who has to do what his master says. This is a, um, a special relationship between God and a person. It is also very much in the New Testament uh, how Paul describes his relationship and others as well. It is a, we choose to become subservient to uh, the Lord. 
So let's go ahead and, and look at what uh, Nathan is told. Um, this is what the Lord said. He's, uh, Nathan speaks to um, David. You are to build, are you going to build me a house to dwell in? I haven't needed a house since the beginning. I was uh, dwelling in the tabernacle. That was, uh, that was the place that I chose to dwell all the time that Israel has been in existence. Um, and uh, I don't need a house of cedar, so to speak. Uh, you, I can't fit in there. Would wouldn't make any difference uh, to me anyway. It doesn't matter where you build or what you build. That's not going to be a representation of who I am. And I don't want you to think that building it will somehow please me because I don't need it. Um, but God takes the initiative and he turns that request, which he's not saying was um, unwelcomed or not wanted or any of those things. He wasn't trying to rebuke David. He was trying to explain to him who he is. And that is a very different idea um, than it might be of any other um, uh, god, if you will, on the earth, that a king would build a, a temple to their god to show <clears throat> other nations perhaps how important he was. So he turns it really, and he says, so now, this is what you're to say. Don't worry about building me a house, uh, David. I'm going to build a house for you. And in the Hebrew, that word house is not um, a building or a dwelling place or uh, something that you can touch. It is actually um, a lineage, a household, a dynasty, if you will. So he says, I... I'm going to turn uh, your concept of building a house into what I want to do, and that is I'm going to make a house for you. So let's go ahead and look uh, further what God is saying through Nathan to David. He, he explains that why J David was chosen to be a prince over God's people and be their king, um, that he recognizing that God is actually the king of Israel and that uh, David is a prince or a vice regent or an earthly ruler who is divinely appointed. And he explains that when he says, I took you from the pasture and I've been with you wherever you will, uh, wherever you were, and I've destroyed your enemies and I'm going to make your name great on the earth. And I will designate a place for my people Israel and plant them. And he has done that. He's already gone through all of those steps. He's, he's chosen David, brought him to Jerusalem, made him king. And, um, he's, and he's, the Lord is explaining, I've already done those. Um, um, I'm going to actually give you peace in the land and your enemies won't disturb you anymore. It will take a little bit, but that did happen. And he did promise that he would have rest from his enemies. And then he says, uh, but I will make, and that's where I'd like to begin with the, um, in, in verse, um, now, let's see, it would be a uh, tiny little verse 11, verse, the end of verse 11, as it goes into the thought in verse 12 of chapter 7, the Lord himself will make a house for you. And we're not speaking of um, a building, obviously, but this is a uh, covenant. When he says, I will, that is a promise, making a promise, and whatever God says will happen, just like it did with um, creation. And so let's um, uh, look at it again 
And as I just follow along on the page that I printed out or sent to you on, on email this morning, the Lord is promising that David's descendants will reign from the throne in Jerusalem and establish his kingdom. And we see uh, the thing that happens very often from now on in anything that is prophetic. There is a lot of layering. It has happened occasionally in the past, but it's not quite the same as it is here. Uh, the, by the layering of the prophecy, I, I mean there is a, a thing that's going to happen sooner and then a thing that will happen later. And it comes in layers or in events as they are revealed over time. And so in verse 12 through 15, we have the covenant that God made with David, the promise that God made between himself and with David. And um, some of that has been fulfilled. A good bit of it has been fulfilled. It will be fulfilled at this time that we're speaking about, and then it will be fulfilled in the future. And there is still uh, prophecy that still today has yet to be fulfilled. Um, and, and I think we need to just go through uh, carefully what it is that God has said uh, to David and then look at the scripture that has been uh, given to us to show that at least some of it if not a great deal of it, has already been fulfilled. And with this, we are introduced to another layer in the revelation of God and his redemptive plan that he set in motion way back in the Garden of Eden. It has been a plan that has been added to many times and in many different ways uh, by his word that he said, I will do a certain thing. So, uh, verse 12, when your days are fulfilled and you lie, lie down with your fathers, that means there's going to come a time when your life will be over, David, and then something will happen following it. So he, he is already promising that there's a future for David's family on the throne in Jerusalem. This would be very different than it was for Saul. And he explains that further in the uh, verses that we read. It didn't happen for Saul. And that was the expectation, and it was all around them, all the countries around them. Their kings would pass down their um, uh, kingship to their uh, son, usually their eldest son, but to one of their uh, family that followed them. And that was uh, a way to establish kingdoms in that way. If you got your kingship by killing the king and taking over, it was somehow illegitimate. So a legitimate kingdom is one that has passed from father to son. So the kingship here is a role. It, that's, it's more important, though, than D, just DNA. It's an identity. It is a father-son relationship that is looked at and established here uh, as a concept in scripture. So when you when you're die, there's going to be someone that uh, I, it says further in verse 12, I, the Lord, will raise up from your offspring after you. It doesn't say firstborn. It doesn't say um, son. It doesn't say a lot of things that you might think would um, sort of narrow it down. It just said the uh, one that will follow you. As we find out, it was not David's first son. It was not even, uh, it was, he, he wasn't even his first wife or any of those things that would be the typical way that royalty would be passed down. Um, the succession uh, 
would be very unique for David, but it will be an offspring um, after you. And it does say that it will come from your body, meaning uh, your bloodline, your seed line, your tribe. It's going to come from you. And I will establish his kingdom. And I tried to use colors to uh, look at the pronouns. Um, and it's, it, I, I think when I printed it out, those greens and blues are a little bit <laughs> difficult to distinguish, but uh, let's look at it. His kingdom uh, looks at maybe the, um, uh, the, the layered uh, prophecy here that uh, also uh, is first presented here. So let me stop stammering around here and just read the scripture. I will establish his kingdom. That may be our first indication that there, are, there is a near and far prophecy because obviously Solomon that followed David was the, the one that is directly spoken of as his offspring that came from his body, but it also will be uh, a future prophecy. He shall build, now we're speaking of Solomon, um, the offspring uh, that is spoken of is Solomon at this point. He shall build a house for my name. That is Solomon's job. That, and we will read about that when we get to First Kings. Um, his job will be a temple or a house for my name. And that's an important distinction there, uh, which I quoted in the First Kings chapter 2. Uh, there for you. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So God has established and stated that there will be a kingdom of Israel in Jerusalem forever, which means it cannot be dependent upon a human being, which would be an offspring of David. And so we need to think through here what, what the scripture is teaching us and be careful here to understand what the Lord is telling us here. Uh, he will build a house and his uh, a kingdom will be established forever. And then it says, I will be to him a father. And this is not a DNA type relationship, but an identity relationship, as, it, as in king and um, prince, and then that prince becomes the king and so on. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. There is a uh, relationship between the, uh, that is described here, that will be a relationship that describes this forever kingdom. And when he commits iniquity, and this is where we have to be careful to understand that the first mention of the uh, offspring cannot be Jesus, because we see here that uh, if he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with a rod of men and with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love, which is uh, interpreted his said, as we talked about, will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. So they knew that uh, the, the previous king of Israel, his kingdom had been taken away because of his sin. And uh, this is a promise that the kingdom will not be removed from um, Jerusalem uh, because of the iniquity of the king who happens to be on the throne. And we will read that now for the rest of, of the history uh, of the kings in Jerusalem. But it speaks of um, uh, the, po the, the, the possibility of sinning. 
And so it cannot, in this case, the near prophecy be referring to Jesus. It has to be referring to a human, which will be the offspring of David. So let's look at the confirmation that this did happen already. Uh, 1 Kings 2, 1 through 4. When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon, his son, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. And then this is the confirmation that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me. And then David repeats what the Lord told him. If your sons pay close attention in to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a throne, uh, a man on the throne in Israel. Now, we know that um, because we have the benefit of looking back all these thousands of years, that they did lose the throne in Israel. They did, the king did fall. The king did uh, sin, and the people did sin. They did disobey God's commandment, and they were exiled from the land. Those things did happen. But the kingdom that was established by God did not go away. And that's what we need to see in the far prophecy, uh, which is in the sentence or so that follows uh, that statement in verses 12 through 15 back in uh, 2 Samuel. So let's take a look then at verse 14 because it sort of finishes the thought of, of the foreverness of the kingdom. And it, it says, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, when we speak of forever, that is a divine only kind of thing only a, a divine only god is eternal everlasting without end only god and so it can only be a divine one who is now on the throne who can take over the throne and while it seems a little confusing and it must have been um kind of a difficult thing for David to take in, as we'll see in his prayer, um, for him to understand all of its meaning, because he, of course, was writing a thousand years before the Lord Jesus was even born. Uh, but uh, he, he seems to understand uh, the, the nature so it, this, uh, I've got the wrong uh, notation on your handout. The far is verse 16, not verse 14. Your uh, house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. That is the last statement, and that means that there's something that's going to be different about your kingdom and the throne that in Jerusalem that is different and unique from ever before or ever will be. And that is the far prophecy. And so if we want to look at how that prophecy has started, let's look um, uh, in Luke 1. And this is the statement made to um, Mary when Gabriel came to her to tell her that she had been chosen uh, to bear um, a son. And in verse 31 through, it's actually 33, I have another typo there, sorry. Um, it says, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. 
and he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. And that was the promise uh, that God gave through the angel gave Gabriel to Mary that was recorded for us to understand that this is how God was going to fulfill the prophecy that he had made to David all these many years, um, a thousand at this point, uh, when Luke is writing him more than a thousand years before, is more than 3,000 years for us. So we can see that God did fulfill his promised covenant and he is fulfilling. And we, we, when we read of the very first things that the Lord Jesus began teaching when he was, um, uh, when he, after he was baptized and he came to teach and preach to the people of Israel, he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand meaning the king has arrived, and that was how he uh, presented himself. So he is presented as the king who is the uh, God's one on the throne uh, from Jerusalem. Of course, they rejected him, and so the kingdom was removed again from um, uh, Israel, but it will come back with God's, with the Lord's second coming. And that's how we know that this is a forever kingdom. And I, I just wrote there a few of the things um, uh, about that, which uh, you can read as well as I. It, it's, it's an unconditional covenant. It, that means it doesn't depend on people for it to be accomplished. It, it will be accomplished. And the Lord Jesus did um, come as he was promised the first time and was uh, to establish his kingdom. That kingdom will be finished and fulfilled um, someday in the future. We don't know when, but when he comes again, he will come to rule with an, um, um, a rod of iron, as it does uh, tell us later on in the scripture. This is a marvelous covenant. This is the first time we are introduced to a king that is coming, an anointed one that is coming. And it was from this point on that Israel began to really look for someone who would be a, a king like David, because David was their best and greatest king. Uh, uh, in, in terms of him serving them and taking care of them and providing um, a marvelous kingdom for them. They wanted that king. They wanted the rescuer, the, the warrior, the, the one who was uh, sh like a shepherd as well. But they were not able to understand that this anointed one that was coming uh, would be the one that is presented in uh, the second psalm and many of the psalms that we call the messianic psalms later on. We don't have time to really go through all of those things. We're, we're running out of our time here, but I do want to uh, just just contemplate to meditate on the pieces of this covenant. I detail them out, hopefully to kind of help us see and focus on what it is God is promising. God affirms the promise of the land, a place for my people Israel. Do they have a land? Yes, there are people who are Jews who have returned to the place, uh, the same place that Jerusalem has always been, and it is called Israel today. That has 
always been God's piece of property, which he purchased and made and calls his own and gave it to Abraham first and promised that it would be forever even to Abraham. My people will have a home of their own. They will no longer be disturbed or oppressed by wicked people anymore. Those things have not happened entirely, but they're coming. David's son will succeed him on the throne as the king of Israel. That did happen um, and will. Um, it's not the DNA son of David, but it is the son following in his type, if you will, uh, who is the Lord Jesus who will sit on the throne. And the son, Solomon, did build a temple that was um, well established and was um, the center of Israeli culture and society for many years. And they want to build another one even today. And it, they, the Lord Jesus did come from the tribe of Judah, and he, he will reign uh, from Jerusalem one day. And so this will be a throne and a kingdom that, <clears throat> that is forever. Excuse me. <clears throat> So David is given this word from Nathan. I don't know how you would have received it. I, I wonder how I would have felt or what I would have been thinking if I had received such an enormous announcement um, to my musing that I might have had that said, this is, doesn't seem right that I have a big house and God doesn't have a big house. We ought to build him a house. Uh, but from that, God turned it into a prophecy about his coming uh, Messiah and promised king. And David's response is really remarkable. It is recorded for us here as a, as a, a prayer in response to having received this vision that um, Nathan had been given. The king went in and sat in the presence of the Lord. That is, he went to the place that he had prepared where the Ark of the Covenant, which was the promised presence of God, he went and sat in there, whatever the size of that little tent was, that the Ark of the Covenant was, that's where David went and sat and began to pray and to meditate and to think on the enormity of the covenant that had just been given to him. And he responds in that humility, who am I, Lord, that my household, my lineage, that you have brought me this far? Because he's reflecting on the fact that he started out as a shepherd. What you've done was a little thing to you, but you have spoken about it. To, and then we see the beginning of 10 times David refers to himself as your servant. He recognized a very unique and special relationship between himself and God perhaps for the first time, because he doesn't speak of himself as a servant prior to this. And he says, and in relation, this is a relation, or excuse me, not relation, a revelation. Let me read it correctly. And this is a revelation for mankind. He recognized that this was not uh, just my next, the next one to follow me after I'm dead, and maybe his to follow him after he's dead. It's not quite that. It is to, in the distant future, unseen amount of time. So he says, this is a revelation for mankind. He recognized the enormity of this covenant promise. He is overwhelmed 
by the by the idea of it, I guess, because of your word and according to your will, you have revealed all these great things to your servant. And then he begins to reflect and the whole next paragraph, 22 through 24, that paragraph really reflects his understanding of who God is. And he refers to him as Lord God, which is um, uh, Adonai Elohim. And in today's Hebrew, it would be Hashem. It was the word that was unique in Hebrew just for, uh, for God. And it was um, in, in all of the reverence that he could he could muster David is trying to write about how great he understands God is just from understanding this revelation that he's been given. And then he um, beseeches the Lord in 25, please fulfill the promise forever that you've made. Make this happen. And then he refers to him as the Lord in this translation of armies, but it's best the Lord of hosts is God over Israel. The house of your servant David will be established before you since the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, has revealed to this your servant when he said, I will build a house for you. He's just repeating and affirming, and he's saying, please make sure that it happens just as you've said. And then he ends it, for, for you, Lord God, have spoken, and with your blessing, your servant's house will be blessed forever. So he's saying, I believe your promise. I'm claiming your promise. I will live my life and, in, and my thinking will be in terms of your have, have, have established through me a forever kingdom. From this point on, Israel and all of mankind would be uh, waiting for God's son, the son of David, to establish that forever kingdom. It would not come for about a thousand years from this point, um, and it would be rejected, but God, through his son, did establish his forever kingdom and his forever king. He is ruling and reigning now, but it is not on the throne in, in Jerusalem until he comes back. But this is a sure foundation and the rock upon which uh, God is building his kingdom, his, um, his divine forever kingdom would be on his son who would be on the throne in um, in that kingdom. It also gives us and, and, and confirms for us that there is, um, Israel will always be and Jerusalem will always be. There will be times when it is crushed down and seemingly destroyed, but it will be taken back and taken back. And someday the Lord is coming again and he will actually sit on his throne in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, in the geographic location where it is, it will be uh, very different looking than it is now. Um, and it will be an eternal kingdom. And we have to look at the other books of prophecy to understand how um, how that's different, how it's very different, but it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous picture. And this is the first time we see this, um, this picture of a Messiah, a promised king, an anointed one to, to come. I went through the Psalm 2, which was our 
uh, in our reading this week, but it's also the first of the Messianic Psalms. And I put a number of them listed there for you. We find out a great deal about this coming Messiah through these Psalms. And they're very helpful for us to know who's coming and what, what things will be like even in the future kingdom by reading this Psalms. And one of the things uh, is very clear um, that uh, someday, even though all the nations are going to come against Jerusalem, God is going to laugh at them as if they think they're somebody and they're able to overthrow Jerusalem, but God is going to laugh at them and uh, take, take back his inheritance. He will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession, he says in Psalms 2. And uh, he describes that, that when the Lord Jesus takes his throne in Jerusalem, it's not going to be as someone who is weak and impotent and, and is somehow um, uh, just because he was born uh, made him king. It will be he will rule, he will rule with a rod of iron. And he's going to destroy the nations of the earth who would uh, rebel against him and his kingdom. We have a very important warning in uh, Psalms 2 that is presented for the first time uh, as well. When this Messiah comes as king, be warned, be wise, serve him, celebrate him, and that famous uh, term which we, we sometimes read about even now, um, that term, kiss the sun, is uh, first presented here, but there I uh, gave you some references. It has, a, uh, has with it the understanding, not like you rejected him and had the opportunity to reject him, Israel, the first time he came, the Lord Jesus, but this time you will be subjected to him and you will wish to be subjected to him um, as your ruler, recognizing that he is God's son. And it, the, it will be an act of worship. So e the, the warning is either we accept him as God's son and allow his rule or he will be angry and there will be death and destruction. It ends with a blessing, an important blessing. Blessed are those who take refuge in the Son, in the promised Messiah coming. Take refuge, meaning be protected from God's wrath. We need to move forward in our reading for this week uh, because there are so many other important things that, that we could we could spend more time and I, I don't know if I've been able to convey how really important that covenant made with David was for completely reorganizing all of the rest of the um, thinking about kings and Jerusalem and uh, prophecy and all of those things, which we'll be reading in the weeks to come. Just briefly, let me go through the, we have uh, chapter eight and nine. Now we begin to see that David continues the march to um, subdue the nations around him and to organize and reign over Israel, uh, administering justice and righteousness for all his people. And we see the um, in the end of chapter eight, how uh, David organized his administration to be, uh, useful in the end of administering justice and righteousness for all his people. And then we read uh, in chapter 9 that unique and marvelous story, story about Mephibosheth. Now, remember, Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son, 
And when he was about five years old, back in 1010 BC, which would have been uh, from this writing, uh, maybe 12 years or so before, uh, maybe more. He was five years old when Saul, his grandfather, and Jonathan, his father, were killed in battle uh, by the Philistines, and we read about that in 1 Samuel. Um, when they were killed, the nurse caring for this or responsible for this five-year-old child probably with other children and other women, ran for their lives because they thought they would be killed um, like the men. And that was a common thing. So they ran for their lives and somehow he fell or was dropped or was injured. And he was uh, injured in both of his legs, and both his feet. It is at the writing of chapter 9 is about 995 BC, and Mephibosheth is about 20 years old at this point. He is married and the father of a, of a son, um, and he is living with um, on the property that was owned by his father and his grandfather in the tribe of Benjamin area. And Ziba, the um, master servant of, the, of Saul, um, was sort of running things, and, and Mephibosheth was just living on the land um, because he was crippled and couldn't work, and Ziba knew he was uh, Saul's grandson, Jonathan's son, and was taking care of him, but um, he had no power, he had no ownership or anything. Ziba was in control, and uh, David asked, um, I suppose those in his cabinet is an administration. Is there anyone remaining from the family of Saul? Because he recalls his promise to Jonathan that um, forever he would uh, take care of Jonathan's family if something happened to Jonathan. So he, he made that covenant a forever covenant with Jonathan. And so um, he's asking, is, should there be anybody that I can make sure. And they found him um, in Lod Lodabar, in the house of Mekar, Makir. And David said, well, bring him here. And I can imagine when they packed up to go from the place that they were living about 10, maybe 15 miles away, he said, we're going to see the king. Must have been an amazing time um, in Mephibosheth's life. When he gets there, he, he is given the promise of having his grandfather's fields restored to him by ownership. The land was absolutely essential. Having ownership of the land was very essential to families in Israel. And so having this restored meant that he had a future and his children would have a future on the land. So um, this promise was an amazing thing. I sort of see it as a picture of the shepherd going after the one lost sheep, showing a picture of God's hesed, his amazing forever faithful love. He goes after the one lost sheep. And he gave him three things in, in uh, response. He gave him uh, his master's kingdom, or the uh, master's land, Saul's land. And he gave him servants to work the ground for him. And um, he, uh, he said, you're going to eat at my table. This was a picture of a man who was an orphan being now treated and, and um, uh, would be, be able to live his life now as the son of the king. What a beautiful picture of the adoption of um, uh, uh, being adopted by the king. 
the Apostle Paul used that picture um, in Romans when he talked about the adoption of uh, us as uh, believers into God's kingdom, the King, um, King Jesus adopting us by his love. We are made, uh, Mephibosheth was made as if he were one of the son's kings. And it's interesting to see that he had a massive amount of land and he had 35 men to work that land and restore it and bring him great profit and great promise for the future. And it was uh, just done because uh, David had made a promise and he kept his promise. <clears throat> Vince Habner wrote about this. He says, I'm a pilgrim and a stranger on the earth, but I am not an orphan. That's what the Mephibosheth could say from now on. I'm not an orphan. I haven't been thrown away. It's a marvelous picture that is sort of tucked in here in this second um, book of Samuel, chapter 9. It's, it's, it's a message to us of hope and of how God wants us to uh, treat um, his people. Chapter 10, 11, and 12, chap these three chapters really go together. And it's important to sort of see them so that we have context. And this is where we'll finish up today. Um, it's um, uh, important for us to get through this, these last chapters in the reading this week <clears throat> so that we can really see the full picture of how God is working in David's life and in David's kingdom that he's given him. Uh, the assignment that was given to David as well as David's life. Uh, we get um, uh, a picture of those that we, I think, can apply to ourselves as well. We begin a new section, as is often in these chapters. It starts off with later on or sometime later or a period of time uh, is given, like in chapter 11 in, in the spring. So we know a new section or a new, new uh, thinking and a new piece of information is going to be added to us. So we begin this new section. And we see that it's now been several years, and it's going to give us some historical context um, because we are probably um, approaching, um, well, it's not quite, but it's very near 10 years, 20 years rather, into David's kingship. Um, things are well established, but there are still continuing. Uh, problems, um, as there always is in a kingdom, I would think, and in any nation, there are always things that come up and have to be dealt with. And we are introduced to that in chapter 10, where the Ammonites uh, are a continuing problem. I put a uh, picture of some maps um, and, and just a little bit of discussion, but I wanted us to be able to think about a location of where chapter 10 is taking place. It is among, it's on the east side of uh, the Jordan River, and it's in the area of the Ammonites, and this capital city, Rabbah, um, is the one that is mentioned here, and that would have been where the king who uh, we see in um, 2 Samuel 10, the king um, has died and his son uh, comes to take his place. And uh, David has decided to, to reach out and send condolences, king to king, kind of a, um, a respect thing to sort of say, I'm sorry, the, the king is dead, um, and wish you well kind of thing. And But there was so much mistrust and so much hatred between the Ammonites. Remember, that's 
the lineage of Lot, one of the two sons of Lot. Uh, the Ammonites and the Moabites are of the same blood, uh, so to speak, as um, Abraham, and, but not of the tribes of Israel. So the Ammonites were a continuing thorn in the flesh for uh, David as well. Well, it looks like the new king in Ammon decided to not accept the condolences that David sent, and he, uh, the people, that, the men who took those condolences to the king were um, uh, embarrassed and were um, insulted and they shaved off half their beards. It's hard to know exactly what that looked like, but it was probably half of their face was shaved and the other half wasn't. They cut their clothes so that their butt showed and sent them away. And of course, it was the idea was to ridicule and to insult and to say, "Don't, I'm not accepting your condolences. Well, when uh, David heard about that. He responded to them kindly, his men. He said, just stay in Jericho until your, your beards grow back. He didn't want to expose them to any further ridicule or allow the king to take any benefit of their ridicule. And then <clears throat> David said, well, uh, we'll have to treat this uh, as the thing that it is almost an act of war. And so um, it, it looks like they, uh, the Ammonites uh, recognized that they had made uh, David very angry and they got together and got together 20,000 foot soldiers. And um, David heard about that and said, well, I guess you think you want to go to war. So he sent Joab. Now, we talked about Joab before. That was his chief general of his armed forces. He sent Joab and all the elite troops, and um, they arrayed, and they formed a battle line. And Joab, the, I'm just sort of paraphrasing the story here, they... Um, arrayed the army uh, together. And uh, let me see. I have to get my chapters together. Um, and they arrayed their armies together. And uh, Joab is recognizing that it is an important thing for them to uh, let's see here. Sorry, I've just got my papers separated here and I've got to get them back together again. Okay, I think I found it. <laughs> But the, I, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the idea is that Joab recognized that um, the, there was a, a considerable foe against him, and he and his brother came up with an idea to to sort of surround them. And but Joe, Joe, the point I wanted to say is that Joab um, did not. Let's see. He did not consider himself to be in charge. He allowed, my goodness, I have separated a piece that I have to finish the story. I apologize. Uh, he, he, here it is. And he, he recognized that um, the Armenians, or the Arameans, rather, that would be the Syrians and the Ammonites had joined together, 
and had made a really large army. So um, Joab says, let's prove ourselves that we are going to be strong for our people and we're going to uh, fight for God and may the Lord will be done. And he, he's essentially doing the age old thing that Israel says we have to fight in the name of the Lord, we uh, we recognize that the battle belongs to him, and he gives the battle to the Lord when he realizes that he not only has Ammonites, but Syrians uh, raid against him. And so uh, it looks like the uh, Syrians see this, and they flee, and the Ammonites saw that the Syrians fled. It's, the Arameans is a, a translation of the present day term Syria. So I'm referring to the Assyrians because it's, uh, it's a bigger picture in our minds or better picture in our minds. But the Syrians fled and so the Ammonites saw them fleeing. They fled as well. And so Joab withdrew and went back to Jerusalem. And that was the end of it. Now, when the Syrians saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they regrouped and they went back and wanted to go back to war. And it was reported to David that the Syrians now wanted to go. So this time David gathered all Israel himself and crossed the Jordan and they lined up and it says uh, 700 uh, of their chariots and 40,000 foot soldiers. It was a terrible slaughter against the Syrians. And uh, from then on, uh, David being the victor of this, uh, they made peace with Israel and became their subjects. And um, from then on, it's that for many years, the Syrians were afraid to ever help the um, Ammonites again. And that was the picture that we have of the context that chapter 11 begins. And it's important for us to see that because chapter 11 then begins with uh, in the spring when all the armies tend to go to war, meaning some time has passed from the events that we just talked about. That's why I went through uh, chapter 10 to give some context. It's important for us to see uh, the context in order to appreciate the chapter 11 uh, picture that we have here. So let me catch chapter 11. Too many pieces of paper and I need to note to self, make a better system for keeping my pages in straight. In the spring, when kings march out to war, this is chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, David sent Joab. Well, he had sent him before, so that was would not be unusual. But the context is David is now about 48 or 49 years old. He's been a king for 18 or 19 years. He is literally at the top of his kingship. Uh, most have been defeated. He has really just recently come off this massive defeat against the Syrians. He has pretty much subdued all the enemies of Israel. For the most part, most of them, there's are still skirmishes and um, flare-ups, but for the most part, Israel's enemies have been defeated by David and his military force and his uh, ability as a king to, to rule. And um, he's really at the top. He is, his power is unsurpassed at this point. And so he sends Joab to do this job. Um, Chuck Swindoll says he was, he was 
uh, in the wrong and made the wrong decision and he was now in the wrong place at the wrong time and things went very very badly for him and we see such a contrast from the highs of the time when David was uh, on his knees in the presence of the Lord, talking with the Lord, having just received a marvelous forever covenant with the Lord, we see the contrast of him now. As I sort of wrote, in the little blurb that I put for chapter 11 on your handout. <clears throat> he stayed in Jerusalem with no purpose and no schedule. He was idle. He was um, not acting like a king. He was, um, had put himself in such a vulnerable, spiritually vulnerable place that he, it, uh, Satan saw this as a way to attack him, and he did. I put there just as a thought because I, I sometimes find myself there. It's sort of like clicking the remote or surfing the internet. You sort of just get through the day not accomplishing much, not very useful, not, not seeing yourself as uh, wasting time, even though that's really what you're doing. And th that is, makes you a vulnerable, in a vulnerable place. So I, I think the lesson for us here, and, and we obviously read what happened here, but being lazy, idle, or just staying comfortable and having no purpose, that is, sending someone else to do our job, like David sent Joab, um, makes you stupid. Sin makes you stupid. And you make really stupid mistakes. And you are vulnerable uh, to the attack of temptation. And that's, as, as I mentioned there, that's when Satan shows up. Well, the picture is drawn for us here of David um, moving from the um, being tempted by a beautiful woman bathing on her rooftop to um, being dragged away by desire and desire is conceived and it gives birth to sin as James 1 14 and 15 tells us that is the pathway of sin has always been and always will be and so um, things go from bad to worse um, she becomes pregnant. Now, there are two people involved in this, and I didn't really discuss um, Bathsheba, but she had to have contributed somewhat to this. Uh, I don't think that this is a picture of rape so much, because apparently she consented to some degree. Uh, she knew she was pregnant. Uh, she was uh, married, just like David knew she was married because he had been told. Um, so there's some complicity here. I don't know. I'm not trying to judge which, which it is, but the picture is given to us here that um, what, how God views sin and what sin does to people even God's people, <clears throat> even my servant David. This, I think, is the picture that we need to see here. Bathsheba is pregnant. David has conspired to cover it up, has Uriah murdered, tries to stay with things covered, bringing in people to his lies and his conspiracy and causing um, great havoc in his own soul. But he thinks he's gotten away with it when God sent Nathan. 
And that's the important picture that I think that we have to see here. God sent Nathan. That's chapter 12, begins with chapter 12. After the sin has happened, after all the problems, after the tragedy, when David thinks everything is going to be okay and pass over and we'll get through this somehow, <clears throat> even though everything he's tried has um, been foiled, it was God who sent Nathan to David. So God intervened in David's life again, and he uses his prophet because that's the one who carries the word of the Lord, and God needed to speak to David, and so he used his word. Same thing for us. We have it written now, but it's still God's word, and it still has to speak to us in the same way as Nathan did to David. And Nathan... It must have been really very, uh, just thinking of the human, Nathan, must have been very difficult for him to have to approach the king and tell him what the Lord told him to tell him. This is after pretty much all the bad things have happened. The child has died. And um, Bathsheba has been brought and um, brought into the palace. And David speaks to, I mean, Nathan speaks to David. And he tells him a story, a parable, which turns out to be a true story. And we have uh, characters that uh, mean various things, as all parables do. Uh, there's a rich man. And he has a very large uh, flock of herds, and there's a poor man, and he only has one little ewe lamb. That's a little female lamb. He only has that one little, and he loved her and loved her. And it says that um, uh, we have a traveler um, intervenes in here. Uh, the, we, but the picture is the the rich man has many flocks and herds, and we have a poor man who has a single little um, ewe lamb. A traveler came. What is that? A picture of sin entering our lives. A traveler shows up and presents a situation that needs to be responded to. It's a picture that Nathan is drawing for David. He comes to the rich man, which is David, and the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler, so he instead took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the guest. This is an astonishing thing to David. He sees this story and, and reacts to it emotionally and responds in anger. So the picture that Nathan has drawn for David is working in David's heart and preparing him for what has to come. And that's an important thing because um, many times parables or pictures of someone else uh, can help us with uh, understanding uh, what's happening in our lives and what it means. And, and we have to sort of separate ourselves from ourselves and look at ourselves as if we're looking at someone else. And I think that's what Nathan is trying to do with David. And so David responds emotionally and in anger. How can, a, how can this rich man who has everything, pick the one valuable thing from the, from the poor man. And of course, this is a picture of Bathsheba. She happened to be the daughter, the only daughter perhaps, of, uh, of a man who happened to be one of David's 30 uh, close men that he's been with for many, many years. We see that 
in the rest of, of the historical um, uh, context of this story. But um, Nathan goes on um, to respond to David, who has, has an outburst. This guy ought to be killed. Uh, he should be put to death for, for what he's done. This is a terrible thing he's done. And I, 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 there's just so much drama that I wish I could capture or express, rather, to underscore the enormity of the statement that Nathan now makes to David, because this is pivotal in David's life at this point. This has to come to his heart in the way, in such a way as that this will provide the response that we see. Nathan tells David in response to David's anger, you are the man. You're the rich man who took the poor man's little ewe lamb. You're that man. And because of that, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. And then he repeats something that we read in chapter 7. I anointed you king over Israel. I rescued you from Saul. I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that is not enough, I would have given you any more. You can almost hear the heart of God crying. I've given you everything. More than you could even imagine. I have given you everything. Why, David? That's the Lord speaking through Nathan to David. Why then, David, have you despised the Lord's command by doing what I, the Lord, consider evil? Evil is the unabashed, wicked rebellion of people against God. That's the, the enormity. This is not adultery and murder, which are terrible breaches of God's command, obviously. It's not that it is you have been wicked and rebelled against God. That's your evil. That's what you have done. And, and, um, Nathan recounts specifically what he's done. You had Uriah killed. You took, you took Bathsheba and um, in adultery. Verse 10 of chapter 12. Now, therefore, because you did these things, the sword or violence, another way to say violence, will never leave your house because you despise, and that should be a capital me, that is the Lord speaking, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, to be your own wife. There are consequences to rebellion against God that never leave us. And that's what happens. Consequences are forever, um, well, for the lifetime of the individual. Consequences also can be forever spiritually if, um, if the evil, the wicked rebellion of ourselves against God is never forgiven uh, with salvation. So this is a terrible scene that we're reading here in God's word. Nathan continues with this disaster that's going to happen for the rest of your life. I'm going to bring disaster on you from your own family. And he describes that your wives will be given to another before your very eyes out in the open. You try to do things in secret, but I'm going to do them out in front of 
everybody in broad daylight. If you don't get anything else today, and there's an awful lot in this week's readings that are absolutely eternal value to us, but if we don't get anything else, this understanding of David's response to what Nathan has told him from God, so this would be a response to God by David, get this, David responds unequivocally without any hedging or any um, explanation or excuse. He simply says, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan says something almost unbelievable. It's really outlandish. It's, it's hard to believe. But Nathan says, well, and I think it's because Nathan was waiting to see how David would respond before he told him what the Lord would, would say. So when David responded with recognizing his own sin and condemning himself as lost and undone and in absolute place where God could strike him and kill him, because that would be the penalty under God's law for, for both adultery and for murder, that he and Bathsheba really would be stoned to death and there would be, that would be the just response. But Nathan tells David, and the Lord has taken away your sin and you will not die or be killed in the usual response to breaking of these sins. However, because you treated the Lord with such contempt in this matter, the son born to you will die. And that does happen. It, it, we go through and see the things that happen, and we're going to talk more about Solomon's birth and um, his growing up and becoming king as we read pages in the future, but which is sort of the end of the story. But we have to look at how David expressed this event and these things that happened and what Nathan said and what the Lord said to him through Nathan. All of those things uh, David recorded for us in Psalm 51, which is um, near the end of your reading, and as well as in Psalm 32. Both of those are specifically written by David as a response to uh, the events that happened to him and his sin and being caught in his sin and being held to account for his sin and recognizing there would be uh, forever consequences to his sin. Here's how David responded. And I think it's really important for us to benefit from this, to see this marvelous, wonderful grace uh, that it will be extended to David um, in response to his plea. The translation, the, the Holman translation here, we have, I don't think, quite grasped it as well as the uh, King James and the uh, New American Standard and even the um, English Standard versions are really better because it and the be gracious is not capturing it. it is have mercy, have mercy on me is how David begins his prayer, and he says, "I I need that mercy from you according to your has said." that loving kindness and tender mercies, that storehouse of those things that only you, God, can give me. From that storehouse, how wonderful and amazing and stupendous is that grace that uh, David is asking for. He knew that only God could give him that, and there would be no nothing that would help him in his 
brokenness and in his sorrow and in his state of being unforgiven and dirty, as he describes it, um, blamed for the sin. He does, he never gives an excuse. He always states. And uh, in verse three, for instance, I, I know how badly I've sinned. It's, it never gets out of my mind. I can't get rid of it out of my mind. It's always with me. And in verse 4, he says, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight, meaning I understand that I have been wicked and rebellious, and that's how you see me. And I think it's really important for us to see that David is asking for more than forgiveness. He is asking in these verses and spend some time reading. These are marvelous, marvelous things for us to learn in these chapters or these verses in chapter 51 and 32. He recognizes that he needs forgiveness, but more than that, he needs to be cleaned up, which means he needs to have his heart changed. Look at verse 10, create a clean heart and renew a right or, or uh, more faithful spirit within me. He wants a changed heart, not just forgiven. He was forgiven. He was told that he was forgiven for, for some of his sin by Nathan. But David said, I need to be cleaned up. I need a changed heart. God alone can not only forgive sin, but remove it. <clears throat> David knew he could not do that for himself. No matter how many sacrifices he offered, he could not clean himself up, change his heart, wash away the filth of his sin. He couldn't wash away any of it. He wanted to be renewed and changed. He states in verse 10, don't banish me from your presence. That was his most prized thing knowing that he was in God's presence and that God was with him. He did not want ever to lose that. And he was begging God to not remove his presence like he did from Saul. He remembered that. Don't take away your Holy Spirit. And then he said, restore the joy of your salvation. Think about that. What would that look like? What is restoring joy? Joy comes from knowing that you are forgiven, that your heart has been changed, and that you have forever been forgiven. That is the joy that comes. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. We can't get it on our own. It, is, it says in Galatians that it's the, it's the second of the nine that are listed. Love, joy, peace. Joy is a gift from the Holy Spirit. And, and David understood that he, he was missing that, and he wanted to have it restored. He wanted to be clean. He understood in verse 17 <clears throat> that sacrifice, while they were uh, required and was part of the worship, he understood that that was not what God wanted. What God wanted from David <clears throat> was a broken and humbled heart that would be open to be repaired and regenerated and forgiven and cleansed and made useful again. Made so that it would have joy in it. It has to do with um, 
with such profound things as our relationship uh, between ourselves and God, that when that is fractured or broken, life is unbearable until it is repaired. There's so much in these chapters, and I it's just difficult for me to try to capture them. They're just overwhelming to me uh, to see what God's Word is teaching us. Spend some time, again, reading chapter 51, 32, um, in light of what David is asking for, because sometimes that happens in our own lives uh, it can be small sin or big sin it doesn't matter it is absolutely intolerable for the believer to stay in sin and stay in relationship uh with the lord and so when that relationship is broken it is unbearable until it is cleaned up and fixed okay i'm going to stop recording we're out of time now